Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Good mm -hmm. evening. Welcome to Atlanta History Center. Thank you, thank you, thank you for braving the rain and the cold and the traffic and all of that to show up um, for Goldie Taylor tonight. We are so excited that she is here with us. <laughs> oh my gosh. She is joined in conversation tonight by Ms. Brenda Wood who is also an Atlanta icon. A lot, a lot of star power sitting on this couch tonight. So I am so excited about this conversation. I'm going to briefly introduce tonight's guest and this talk and get out of the way so we can get to this wonderful conversation. To those of you I have not yet met, I am Claire Haley. I am Vice President of Author Talks and Democracy Initiatives here at Atlanta History Center. We are so thrilled that you are with us here tonight to celebrate the release of Goldie's memoir, The Love You Save. That is my perfect cue to remind you to turn off all <laughs> cell phones during tonight's event. So that was the perfect reminder. Thank you for that. Um, tonight, if you do have questions, uh, there are some note cards and pens scattered around. If you come up with a question during the conversation this evening, I'm sure there will be many thoughts sparked by it. Um, just go ahead and jot that down on the note card and pass it to the outside of your row. If you're on the end, uh, you can just drop it there on the ground. I'll come by and make sure I collect those. That way I stay out of your view in the center of the aisle there. So once again, we're joined tonight by Goldie Taylor. She needs very little introduction in this room, but she is an absolutely star power journalist, um, cable news political analyst, and human rights activist. Um, she has written for about just about every publication, appeared on about every news show that you could have watched on TV, and we're so glad that she is here with us tonight. Um, she is joined in conversation by Brenda Wood, also a veteran Emmy award-winning broadcast journalist, um, most recently here at 11 Alive right here in Atlanta, but also at many other places around the Southeast. Um, she said she um, occasionally shows up in cameo appearances on national TV shows and here at Atlanta History Center tonight. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Goldie Taylor, Brenda Wood, as they discuss The Love You Save. I have been looking forward to this for a long time since Goldie asked me to uh, be a part of this book tour for her. I'm so honored and proud to be a part of this. And thank you very much. And I'm so proud of Goldie. We've been friends for a long time. She was a commentator for us at Channel 11. And I was always amazed about Goldie. Whenever, whatever subject we would ask her to talk on, she was able to speak to it from a personal point of view. And I would sit there and look at her on the set and was like, well, how, how do you know so much about it? <laughs> Always it was, you know, she, from her per perspective or, you know, an experience that her son or aunt or an uncle or... Always from, I was like, what kind of person has all this experience? And then when I read the book, I was like, oh, okay. This woman, I, 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 she is an amazement on so many levels. So I have, I, I really feel like I should just be bowing down to you. Uh, you are an exquisite writer. Thank you. Uh, so for that, I just like, you know, I, for that, you, the, the journalism in you is amazing. I had to, I, I, I had to, I had to make so many marks in this book. Um, as I as I turned from page to page, I was struck by so many nostalgic references. Y'all, let me. I, I I just put some of them down in this book. As you read it, and it, the book just came out on the uh, stands this Tuesday, so I'm sure many of you uh, have not had a chance to take a look at it, but. So many nostalgic references of us of a certain age, the Zenith TV and stereo console, love. Paul Harvey, yes. Swanson frozen TV dinners, the street lamps that you had to be in the house before they came on, yellow shag carpeting, and the green kitchen appliances. The plastic couch covers, yeah. world book encyclopedias, oh, yeah. and childcraft, <laughs> and childcraft. My mom sold those. ABC's Max Robinson, yeah. 
I got one. Mom's Mabley. Yes. Used to listen to that. She references all those and more. So every time I came to that in the book, uh, I would put it down as like, oh yeah, and start thinking about where I was when, you know, I was looking at the yellow shag carpet or listening to Mom's Mabley. The book ha covers so much of your own life as you're reading it. So it's very personal. It's personal for her. It's her memoir. It's her story. But you can't help but get involved in it yourself. You see yourself in this story with just those nostalgic references. But it's even more than that. Because she, as she's telling it, she's also addressing socioeconomic issues that were going on in that time in our world, in our society, and sometimes in your own family. So she addresses colorism, which is an issue especially in the black family, in the black community, and in our society. Classism, ageism, gender issues, and she addresses housing issues, redlining, poverty, crack co cocaine epidemic in our communities, inequality in education, all in this book. <laughs> As she's telling her story, she is an amazing writer. But tonight, I'm going to just focus on her story. There is so much we could spend time on talking about all the things I just referenced. But her story is so amazing. I want to top it by saying, I don't know how, Goldie, you came out coherent. <laughs> You're more than coherent. Lucky. You are, as I said, a phenomenal woman. You are an amazement to me. You have opened yourself up in the most vulnerable way. Not many people could do what you've done mm -hmm. and really exposed yourself the way you have. So I want to start by asking you, when did you decide that you wanted to write this memoir of your life. And let me say that this is a snapshot of her life, mostly of her middle school years, just her middle school years. When did you decide that you wanted to be this vulnerable and write it? And when did you know that you were ready to do it? That's a question. First, I, I want to say thank you because, you know, I grew up watching Robin Smith in St. Louis on the news. First black woman I'd seen in all of her pristine uh, and esteem uh, presentation. I wanted to be like Robin Smith growing up. And then I, you know, went to the Marine Corps and studied broadcast journalism. Bob Yancey's over there. He was the first, you know, dean I saw going back to college as a young mom with babies in arms. And I went to school because I was watching you on Atlanta television. I was watching um, Monica Kaufman, Amanda Davis, and I wanted to be them. I wanted to be on the news every day talking about what was happening in the communities around us. And so that's what sent me back to a classroom as a young mom and, and having toddlers, yeah, it was a struggle. But gosh, it was well worth it today. So I just want to thank you for being on the other side of the screen for me. Because I didn't make it to an anchor desk, at least not that kind of anchor desk. <laughs> but I think I've had a pretty terrific career I think as a so. commentator. I think yeah. so. And so <laughs> You've done some amazing things. I appreciate things. all of those things. Fantastic. What I will say about this story and I can look around this room that there are people here that I have known and have loved and who have loved me in ways that I cannot number or name. And so this story came on an evening where I was putting the grandbaby, everybody knows who the princess is, <laughs> I was putting the grandbaby to bed and she was about five. And I'd had her for about two years by then. And one of my friends in this room told me I was made for that. 
I said, you got to be kidding because I'm 50 mm -hmm. and I don't want to raise more babies. And she didn't want to sleep in her room. I said, well, you, you know, I have, I have money now. You have curtains and you got comforters and you have things. You know, you have the most beautiful room, you know, for a little girl. Aren't you lucky? Look at these ceiling, the floor windows, right? And um, I said to myself, well, I said to her, when I was your age, I didn't have my own room. And right around your age, girl, I didn't have a bed. And I stopped myself. And because I didn't want to let her have all of that. I didn't want to have to then explain the rest of it. So I put her to bed. I let her sleep in my room. And I took to the floors to think about, why didn't you have a bed? Where were you sleeping at 11, 12, 13, 14 years old? Well, you were on Aunt T. Gerald's floor. And why was that? And so you begin to answer these questions for yourself. And that night, I started to write an essay that I had to write it down to witness it for myself. That was the one day. But then I called Darlene Tree, and I said, we need to have some lunch. This is not a girl's lunch. Don't invite nobody else. It's just us. And so we went, and we had this lunch, and I just spilled it. I said, this is what I need to write down. And I'd asked her the same as I'd asked my daughter you know, about this story. And they both said the same thing. Are you going to publish this? Is this something you need to publish? And I said, yeah, I think I do. Well, we published that first essay. It happened to go live on my Uncle Ross's birthday in 2019 on a Sunday. It went live where? It went live on the Daily Beast. And that day and the day after and the day after, my email filled, my text messages filled, my direct me There were other people. Because I felt alone writing this essay. You know, these 1,100 words were hurtful for me. But it, I needed to just relieve it. But when I began to hear from other people, the lived lives, the people who needed to witness for themselves their own stories, I said, there's probably more to say. And so one thing led to another. And then suddenly, I was sitting just a few hundred yards from here in Thrash coffee house over here. I was sitting upstairs and working on a, what I thought would be a second essay. And it just kept going on for too long. And by the time I was done that afternoon, I came here around 8 in the morning, I didn't leave and probably till 6 or 7 in the evening, I'd written the first three chapters of this book. Mm -hmm. And so here we are back here in the finished book that is on the shelves. And it came because there was a little girl in my life who I thought deserve more and better than I had. And I wanted to tell the world about that story. And so that's why we're here. And thank you, Dawn. At the age of 11, you're riding your bike. You're accosted by a teenage boy in the neighborhood. And you're raped. Yes. What was it like writing that story for this book? in detail, which you did, what was the process that you had to go through to recount that? As you did in this book, had you recounted it ever before in that much detail? Was there a visceral kind of response as you were writing it? I had told it only once, my grandmother Catherine in Florida, who I trusted and trust with my life. I had told it only once. I knew that in her I could have a safe harbor. If I could find it no place else, then there my cat was that place. I had never written it down. I've written down a lot of stories about our family. You know, I, I talked about mothers and fathers and my father's murder I reinvestigated. I've talked about a lot of our story. This was the one that I had never told. And I was, by then, 51. I had just celebrated my 51st birthday when I began to write it down. And I still harbored shame. Mm -hmm. I still felt like there was something wrong with me, that I had allowed this to happen to myself. I was thinking that some 40 years later. I needed to do something about that. I had now become this person who was an advocate 
around gender violence. I had worked with the United Nations around domestic violence globally. I had, I thought I'd conquered all these issues and that I was conquering them for other people. You know, I had given money and time to organizations like Men Stopping Violence. I was, I was in this movement, but there was something for myself that I had not yet resolved. And so writing it down, I needed to tell myself what happened. But after I wrote it down, I got angry. Not at me. The, the shame went away. Well, you were 11 years old. Whatever anybody thought about you and what decision you made or didn't make, which way you turned a bicycle, how late you were out you know, from the park that day, whatever you did, there was nothing that an 11-year-old child could have brought on herself. And that was the freeing moment. That came out in the essay. So I got angry about it. And then I made a call. I called my mother. And, you know, there, she's at an age where self-reflection is, you know, we're well, we're well past the time where self-reflection is a, is a noble thing to do. All right. I, I want to stop yeah. you right there. Because yeah. I want to drill down and get to that. Yeah. So the rape you describe, as I said, in detail. But that was, as I read it, one part of this devastating story. The other part of this story has to do with the shame that was associated with it. Yeah. If I may say, yes, at the hands of your mother. Yeah, family, my mother. Your mother never called the police. Your mother did pretty much say, as you say in the book, she pretty much no, she said it was your fault. Bro, show back, keep moving. Yeah. What were you doing outside? Yeah. And in the book, you say that there was a disgrace associated with it. You say it was, I think, in her estimation what I let somebody do to me, the disgrace I brought into her house and hurled at her feet. It was as, as if my mother tucked away the unpleasantness and moved on. I remember thinking, if not knowing, that I was on my own. Whatever fixing I needed was my wagon to pull. Did your mo you and your mother, and then you say later that there was a bond broken between you all. Yeah. Did, you, did you ever talk about this with your mother as a child? Did she ever comfort you? Was there ever any compassion shown between you and her about the rape? None of that. Um, I say in the book, and, and in so many ways, my mother's the strongest person I've ever met in my entire life. You know, we see our parents as perfect, and they do. And when they gave you direction, that is what you did. If you need to be home at 3.30, this time I walk in the house, right? My mother was a woman who was, she'd lost her husband less than a few years before. He'd been murdered. She had shot the last man that accosted her. But my mother herself had been sexually assaulted when she was 14. She still remembers the powder blue Easter Sunday suit she was wearing that day. And what my mother understood about our circumstances was by then we'd been living in all white St. Anne, Missouri, with a police department that was circling the block looking for my brother and whatever he, they thought he might have been doing that day. Well, he was doing some things. <laughs> uh, Donnie was something. But she made a calculation in her mind of what if she went to the police and told them that this white boy around the corner raped her 11-year-old daughter in 1980 in St. Anne, Missouri. Hmm. And so there was a calculation to be made of how do I keep my child safe? Hmm. And over time, that decision became I need to get her out of here. I need to get her to people who can be with her every day. 
that will be home for her. My mother was working nights at the Marriott at that time that could be home to welcome her every day, that she will have a hot meal and no more swans and dinners. <laughs> they will cook every night. And there will be a bedtime and there will be rules, restrictions that at that point it was, this child needs to survive. Mm -hmm. That was never spoken to me. I was never told this is what the plan is. But now, looking back, that was exactly the plan. Don't go outside because someone will see you. And that will bring the authorities to our house. Mm -hmm. That will bring child services here. And then we'll have to start to answer questions. And my mother taught us that once social services were in your house, they weren't leaving, that they'd be back again. And so she went into protection mode, I know. What I would say about it today, though, is my mother has carried that in others' shames with her. She's carried those burdens as I have. I had no idea. And so when we talk today, it isn't about what life could have been or what she could have done or what I could have done as a teen because, boy, I was rolling stone by the time I hit teenage years or what I could have done. Um, we talk about the love that we have now and my trust because that trust was broken back then. I, I didn't trust the sunshine coming in the morning. But my trust as a now turning 55 year old woman that my mother gave every ounce of who she was. I needed to give her context. This was not to make excuses for who she was, not to make excuses for who my aunt was or what my father did or didn't do. But I need to talk about the strictures of race and poverty and class, all of those things that the America that they were living in mm -hmm. In, in the 1980s, context. I needed to give them the context that I would want for myself. You, so the first time, you had to tell your mom that you were writing this book. Yes. Was that the first time that you and she that really we had a con just, we conversation about, about this in detail? Yeah, yeah. The first but, thing I told her was, well, you know, that cousin bug of ours that you've been helping all these years, she used to beat me in the face. That was the first thing I told her. That was the first thing she I said. She didn't know that. She had no idea. So, I, I no idea. so did she did she have any objection to you writing this memoir and telling this story? Not a single one. Really? My mother said, as I told my daughter wrote her own memoir that came out two weeks before mine. It tells some truths about Goldie Taylor that I don't know if I want everybody to know about, right? <laughs> but my mother said to me the same thing I said to my daughter and had no idea we were having the same conversation. You need to tell the story that only you can tell and tell it all and leave nothing out. And I said to my daughter, I don't, I don't need you to care about how I feel. And my mother said the same to me, I don't need you to care about how I feel. I need you to write this down. I need you to free you. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So on the heels of that rape, you went to live with Auntie, Go uh, Auntie Gerald. Yeah. And there's more trauma. There's more assaults, mm -hmm. physical and psychological, mm -hmm. in that house. Yeah. So here's a woman, and when I say psychological, here's a woman, Auntie Gerald, yeah. who was compassionate minimally. Yeah. Minimally. The rest of it was traumatic. And then there were other traumas in that house. But here is a woman, Auntie Gerald, who seemed to equate your rape with just another one of life's disappointments. Yes. So I surmise that either she was numb to emotions or angry about life and just didn't care anymore. So after growing up in that house and looking back, would you say your story, your story is a continuation of generational trauma? It absolutely is. Um, and I knew that if I didn't make a decision to break cycle now, mm -hmm that my daughters would continue to carry. I have a granddaughter who is now turning 10 who would carry. 
and it would continue to traipse its way down our bloodline. So in writing this book, it caused me to have to go back and see how they lived before we were a twinkle in their eyes. And to learn that my oldest cousin, Ronnie Lee, who plays a big role in this book, he was a child of rape. Aunt Gerald had been assaulted. And this was something that the family has now begun to talk about in an open way. And as you said, your, mo your mom had been assaulted. My mom had been assaulted. And these were things that, you know what? We are black women living and surviving in St. Louis. Our job is to move on and raise these babies of ours. Right, right. Yeah. As you were telling, the, as you tell the story, there, there, there really is a thread of um, things that happened in that house um, that seemed familiar in my own family. My grandmother, my grandmother was, my grandmother was crazy. Mm -hmm. And, and this, I don't know if this, whether this is unique to black families in particular, um, but you know some of the things you know when you get hurt, yeah. or you know you you got a headache or whatever, the child just go lay down and be over within a minute. You know what I'm saying? Castor like oil, you're, not, you're not going castor to the doctor. Castor oil will solve everything. Castor oil will solve everything. <laughs> everything. You know what? And and so the idea of you know equating rape to child that's mm -hmm. just a, this is another one. So I mean that's extreme, mm -hmm. but if you if you're a black person, think about you know your is it old is is old old school, black culture, this is the way we handle our problems. Dirty laundry. It's dirty laundry. I mean, I, I will say, my grandmother worked as a maid in somebody's house every day. And when she came home every day, she would spank her children every day. Every day. And her rationale was, I know you did something wrong today. And I'm just going to take care of it. Take care of it now. And she would put a pu pillow over their heads mm -hmm. so the neighbors wouldn't hear them screaming mm -hmm. and would spank them every day. Okay. This is my grandmother. That's She's cray cray. <laughs> but this is part of the, I, I feel like this is, the, so who, I, I don't mm -hmm. know what her background was, but that's probably something that was modeled it was. for her. And I felt like, this, I, as I was reading it, I felt like there was a thread that I could, uh, yeah. could, could recognize in your story, a cultural yeah. thread. There was a cultural thread. I had never felt, for the record, abused physically like corporal punishment. We got spanked it like every other kid in the neighborhood, right? And my Uncle Ross, my Aunt Gerald was, you know, uh, she wasn't spanking anybody. She had Ross get to it, right? Ross, that one did, and so go get that child together. I never had a, a piece of hard feeling about that. It was just kind of the way of the world for me. The psychological warfare, though, was another thing, that you've got this child or whomever the child was in the household that my nickname was Dum Dum. Now, I don't know if any of y'all spent more than 10 minutes with me, um, there's a lot of things I am in this world. <laughs> but, but dumb. Dumb, dumb is not one of them. <laughs> but she needed to bring people into where she was, that she needed to make people feel small because she felt small. But as a 12, 13 year old girl, you're not getting why she's presenting herself in this way. Mm -hmm. All you know is that it's coming for you and that it's breaking you down. You know, as a grown woman today, um, I can see exactly what, where it was emanating from. It was emanating from her own pains, mm -hmm. where she thought life missed her. And um, she passed um, a couple of years ago, Auntie Gerald, here in Atlanta, living in a house that I own. Mm -hmm. And so I became the caretaker of, our, of Mary Alice and Geraldine. Um, life is interesting. Life turns around, but yep. I'll tell you what I wanted to hear at the end of her life. You know, when I was 11 or 12, hearing her call my name, it was always something bad because it was my whole name. You know, y'all still call me all the Goldie Taylor, you know, the whole thing. I only wanted to hear her call my name. Yeah, she was passing in her last days. Yeah. Things had turned. Yeah. Turned in such a way that um, they relied on me because they knew I was reliable. They had trained me to be that way. Yeah. So was the rape, writing about the rape, the hardest thing 
you wrote about in this book, or was it something else? No, it, um, it wasn't, because the secrets ran deeper than all of that. Writing about the rape was just the, the, the inciting incident, the trigger, the jump off point for the story itself. You know, everybody's story starts someplace. There's a moment in your life when you know that from that moment on, you're going to be something different. That was that. But who I became in the aftermath and why, that was the story for me. And so when I begin to dig into that, and you, you write a chapter, you stop, you take a breath, you write a chapter, you stop, and you take another breath, is that I was assaulted again mm -hmm. in my aunt's house because there was this thing around that Goldie Taylor was, you know, promiscuous or because this thing had happened to her that she brought on herself, then she was now open game. And so I had an older cousin, basketball player, stand-up basketball player, smelled like a sewer, still smelling today. Um, he's still living, uh, bless his heart. Um, I threatened to set him on fire. I had now come into my own. I had now taken enough, had enough, and he ain't bleeding at first. And so I started walking around with one of my uncle's old uh, Zippo lighters, the cap lighters. I said, you better hope there's no gas in that can when you go to sleep tonight. And I think I was just crazy enough to let myself believe that I would burn this kid in his sleep. I was tired by that time. And angry. And angry that I had been left here with no way out, desperately wanting to leave this house, and here you are knowing that I'm cornered. And so, threatened to set him on fire. That was the one piece of this thing. I, I write about that. But then, at 13 years old, my aunt discovers that I'm pregnant by a then 15-year-old cousin. And what do you do about that? My aunt's relationship to me changed on the spot. She sat me down, we talked. She knew exactly what had gone down by that time. And she said, you know, she had now turned her ire on everybody who would harm me. I think she'd now gotten tired. And uh, they had called and made this appointment for the clinic in East St. Louis, which meant if you made an appointment in East St. Louis, you just went and sat all day till somebody called your name. It was not really an appointment. But we were going to go and sit at this clinic up on State Street. Before we ever got to the clinic, I am in the kitchen with my grandmother. I write about this in the book, and I am doing the dishes when my body begins to expel in miscarry. And my grandmother, I can hear her shrieking today. You know, she called me Goldie because she was from Tunica, Mississippi. She never could pronounce the D. <laughs> and she just was shrieking, Goldie, Goldie. And along comes my uncle, who scoops me up. They've got blankets and sheets, and they put me in the back of Grandmama's old Buick and roll me down to St. Mary's Hospital. I had no idea what was happening to me. I had no idea what was happening to my body um, until it was over, and my aunt comes into the room, and... I had overheard them say that, you know, how far along I had been. I was not out of the first trimester. I had no idea what a trimester was at that time. But I knew what being pregnant was. Because uh, young girls around me my age were pregnant, and they were having babies. My cousin Janice had her first baby, 14, 15 years old. You know, there were, there were babies having around the block. I didn't want to be that but had no idea what was happening to my body until my aunt said to me, you were pregnant. And I said, what do you mean was? What does was mean? And she explains to me then what, what has happened to me. And I said, I guess God didn't want me to be a mama. She said, not right now, but I think he has plans. And that was the the coming together for she and I. That moment synthesized us in a way. She moved those people out of her house. They were her husband's grandchildren, a brother and two sisters and their mother. She moved those people out of her house. They had to leave. She packed them all up. And then it was myself, young fat man who I saw last night, Marcio, and my aunt and uncle and grandmother. 
she decided she was going to clear safe space for me. Well, this is the first time you put all of this together. This was the hardest thing. You, you talk about hardest You thing. said this was secrets, this family was secret. secrets. This was family secret. You know, he came, the, the, the kid came, I call. I still call him the kid because last time I seen him, he was a kid. He came to Atlanta some years ago. I was on air at CNN. My mama called at work and said, hey, your cousin's over here. I said, over where? She was over my house. I said, you mean the house I own? Put him out. Mm -hmm. I Is this the one who assaulted you? I haven't seen or talked to him since. I know where he lives. Yeah. And, you know, I get a, a message from one of his siblings or him on Facebook, and I just press delete and move on. Yeah. Yes. I've deleted it from my life. Right. Yeah. That, oh, wow. All right. That was the hardest thing to write about. At one point, you did strongly consider suicide, like yeah. as in gun in hand to your head. Seconds, seconds away. I have talked about gun ownership, father's gun owner, mother's gun owner, you know, I'm a former Marine, I've talked about gun ownership over time. And, you know, I've talked about the notion of giving up my own weapon. I didn't want a weapon in my house with grandbaby and those kinds of things. But I wrote a story in the Daily Beast some time ago about the other gun in the room. We talk about gun violence in the country and how there are, you know, these uh, 30,000 gun deaths in America every year. Only 15,000 of them are homicides or manslaughters. The other 15 are suicides. And I wanted to talk about that in my relationship with guns. And so there was a time that before I moved to Aunt Geraldine's and mom had the 22 that she'd shot Tony with was still in the house in her silk wrapped scarf and in a plastic zipped bag in the top of her drawer. I can see it as plain as day. And up on a dresser over here was my father's jewelry box that he left after he passed and all of his things. I have that box today. But there was a night just weeks after the initial assault that I walked into her bedroom and sat on the bed and I called my auntie Killer. Some of y'all heard me talk about Killer, K-I-L-L-E-R, Killer. And her real name was Doris Jean. And she was she was the kind of woman, I, I described her, she was the kind of woman that smoked on the toilet. <laughs> and I called Doris Jean and I said, Auntie, I just wanted to call y'all and tell y'all I loved y'all. Because I had never heard, we didn't walk around our family telling each other that we loved each other. It just wasn't a thing. The hugs that I give to my kids, we didn't do that kind of open display of affection thing. Um, and she said, baby, you all right? Because one, that must just sound crazy. That Twelve year old girls, yeah, you want to tell love you Out of character. I'm, yeah, I'm just fine. I'm just fine. I'm watching what is then the early CNN. We had cable in the house, 1980, and it just washed over me that I did not feel I had a place in the world to be. That I belonged to nothing and nobody was left and right. And all I could see was that jewelry box and my father and how much I missed having him and what I thought in my mind he would have done to this boy. Mm -hmm. I wanted my mother to take this gun down the street and walk up and knock on this boy's door and shoot him. I wanted her to do something. If she could shoot Tony, I said, how come you can't go get this kid? And so all I wanted at that moment was to be with dad. And so I took gun to go in the bathroom and I am seated in this small bathroom, the only bathroom in the house, and it's got that ugly green tiling stuff. And I am on the floor with my back against the door. My brother and his girlfriend, Wilma, in the basement doing Lord knows what they were doing in this basement. I can smell it, but you know. And I am, um, I've got my mother's gun. I've gotten it out of a drawer. And I am beginning to think, you know, we call it suicidal, suicide ideation today. There's a name for it today. But I'm beginning to think, who's going to sing when I'm gone? Will my mother take us back to Mount Perry in our church? What will she put on me? I'm beginning to think about what's going to happen tomorrow because this is over tonight. Wow. 
and you know I don't know that I knew how to work a gun but I sure knew about pulling triggers and this was a small 22 it was seconds that I am now singing and my brother comes banging on the door and you know he's late teens at that time and you know half high out of his head and he is screaming for me to get out of his bathroom girl because I gotta go and I've long said that my brother's pissing saved my life <laughs> <laughs> it was seconds and you know he comes in and I grab a towel and I'm rapping trying to hide what I've done and then the next day comes and the next day comes and you know I'm just on my own but I'm okay with the living. Um, I'm just starting to do things for myself now. I'm starting to steal my mother's cigarettes and smoke her Benson and Hedges, you know, down by the creek. I'm starting to come into a 12-year-old's life that a 12-year-old shouldn't have mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. But those were those moments where, um, you know, you got a little girl missing a daddy who she thought what she thought he was, what she believed him to be at that time. Right, and your mom wasn't there. Mm -hmm. you, you're yeah. So you you yeah, you're angry. You're you've pretty much decided I I can't count on anybody. Can't count on I, I, I'm on my own. Not to feed me. Not right. to get home at night. Not to care. Not to care about it. So you wanted to kill yourself, what? Because you were raped. Mm -mm. You wanted to kill yourself. I was alone. Because you were alone. I was alone. <coughs> Nobody cared. That was my feeling about it all. Yeah. So you go to this school. Well, let me back up. Okay. You found something that filled the void. <laughs> Your escape hatch was reading. Mm -hmm. And let's back up because you began reading at the age of three. And I want to know how that happened. <laughs> how did that happen? Ernie and Big Bird and them. <laughs> because they'd sit us in front of the television set. That was the babysitter. And so, you know, sounding out phonetically what a grocery store sign says, what the back of a cereal box says. I think at three and a half or four, my mother was angry because I was reading Jet magazines. <laughs> <laughs> You were reading anything and I everything. I was reading anything and everything that they had. Um, and my, my Aunt Geraldine, when I was three, put me into school. She put me into kinder care, um, which was the first uh, Head Start program in the mm -hmm. country in East St. Louis. And that was the start of my organized education. I remember being in Skip to the first grade and being back on this mat in the back of the room where they were flashing cards to evaluate you and see what you are or what you aren't. And I stayed on the mat a long time. But I was an angry kid even before when you saw it. I was just a pissed off kid. Uh, my mother says it's because of Jackson 5 when it canceled in 1973. <laughs> she says, if, you know, it turned out to be a, a, a tale. But yeah, I, uh, reading world I was reading World Book Child Encyclopedias, Crafts. Child Crafts that my uncle had bought into the house. There was safety in books in our house for all of the psychological warfare, all of how they thought children should or should not be raised, children seen, not heard, honor thy mother, thy father, your days on this uh, world will be short. For all of those things, they were country folk who understood the value of education. And if you were reading a book, no one would bother you. It was like a fence. Hmm. And so it started off as fun, you can read, but then it turned into, if I'm reading, they won't bother with me. Aunt Gerald won't make me you know, go do more chores, whack weeds in the backyard. You know, if I were reading, it was a safe place to be. It did not become a thing of adventure. It was performative early uh -huh. on, but it didn't become a thing of adventure until I got to probably seventh or eighth grade. But by the time I was out of sixth grade, I'd read The Prophet, Julia Cabron's, off of my mother's, because there weren't any children's books at my mother's house. I'd have to read what she had. Right. And so I was reading the physician's desk reference. <laughs> <laughs> Probably why I work for Dana Farber now. <laughs> so there were all of these grown up books. Things that you the child craft was the only kid thing around. So I just read everything I had they had. So you get to this school and you get to this particular teacher mm -hmm. 
and you discover literary icons. And so a couple of questions uh, around that. You, you discover Baldwin. So I, I, reading for you, as I said, an escape, warring is going on in your head, as you said. Mm -hmm. What did reading do for you? How did it settle you down? And what was it about Baldwin that so resonated with you? Mm. So here's where one of those national issues hits the page that doesn't like, don't open it up in that way. They're banning books today. <coughs> they banned Baldwin, Tonnesi Coates, Toni Morrison, Nikki Giovanni. And this book will never make it to a school shelf, a library yeah, shelf. Yeah. And so anything that was, would have been important to me in that day. Peggy Lewis LeCompte, who was the teacher in eighth and ninth grade, my honors English teacher, she would have been jailed for the work that she was doing with us in the classroom. She was showing us reflections of ourselves. And so while I had, by the time I'd gotten to her, read the Iliad of Homer, I had read some Mark Twain, a lot of it was dense uh, mm -hmm. Twain was. Um, she gave me Margaret Walker for my people and said I'm gonna memorize it. She gave me Invictus, British poet. Uh, and we turned into a rap song. Out of the night that cup was <laughs> being executed from pole to pole. I was with her last night in St. Louis. She's 80 years old. And we had this conversation about why she found it necessary to give these children these things when everybody else had counted us out. And she said, Goldie, when I closed the door to 9017 that was our room, she said, I expected excellence without excuses. And you gave me that. She said, I never knew what was happening at home for you. I knew it was something. But all of the 25, 30 kids in my room had something going on at home. So I couldn't spend time on that. I could spend time on their talent. She said, but she reminded me that there was, and I'd written about this in the book, the Iowa Basic Skills Test. And it was just a, uh, a test of uh, aptitude that they used in Missouri and Illinois, it, Iowa being known as a state for education. And I got my scores back. We all got them back. She handed them out, and she gave everybody a copy. She was going to explain. And I looked at my sheet, and I didn't understand how to read a score. I thought I'd failed everything. I was just in tears and feeling like, you know, I was Aunt Jill's dum-dum. I had done poorly on this test. All the X's were down here on the right. And everybody else's X's were down here on the left. And these were the gifted kids, so I must be. Turned out that I ranked the 97th, 98th, 98th percentile in every sector of the test. And I was in eighth grade, and all I could hear her saying was, wow. And she remembered that moment last night. And she said, that is the moment when everybody in the building knew that you were something else. Mm -hmm. And so she started handing me more. Uh, she handed me uh, photocopied uh, of books because she couldn't give me, you know, we didn't have this, this great library. So I got photocopies of things. I still have, uh, you know, things from Toni Morrison, things from the rest of James Baldwin she gave to me. She introduced me to the public librarian down the road at 9th Street and State. Uh, I forged my library card and, you know, she gave me, they gave me every single thing that they had. But what they gave me that I didn't get in St. Anne where I was, and I had had quite an excellent education in St. Anne, they gave me people that looked like me. They gave me people who mm -hmm. made sense of the poverty and violence and other things happening outside our doors to be Negro in this country is to be in a constant state of rage. Well, I was angry enough. And so Baldwin was speaking to me in ways that I can't number a name. Mm -hmm. But he was, and I, you know, he was my playtime thing that when I was bored in class, I'd pull out. So I had a copy of Go Tell It on the Mountain. I'm in history class with Mr. Nave, guy with a long pipe and beard and, you know, he was, Nave and I had an experience together. He called me Bookmobile. I was reading in his class because I was bored with the history book he was teaching from. I'd had it at the other school district. 
He sends me down to the office. If you're not going to listen to me, get your stuff, get on down to Mr. McDaniel's office. I get down to the office, and I'm like, I'm just reading a book, you know. And he's not teaching me anything, he says. And they call Mrs. Lacombe, though, and she shows up. And she says, you know, I don't care how you did on the eye-based skills test or what you read or there are rules here to be followed. And she laid down her law. And that night I had a new essay to write about James Baldwin. I enjoyed it so much that I started writing a second. I went back to the library looking for reference books that mentioned James Baldwin. There were none. And so the second essay was called James Baldwin is Missing. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And so this book published on Monday comes out just as I'm learning that Ron DeSantis is banning James Baldwin's book in Florida. You know, what saved my life, what gave me a life, what gave me a career, what has informed how I've raised my children, somebody wants to take out of a classroom. Yeah, you know, you're, you're, this part of the story is a, is a textbook example of the power of the written word and these are straightforward, simple things. The power of the written word and a perceptive good teacher. Mm -hmm. Two very straightforward things. Mm -hmm. Put them together, Put them together. and they can change a child's life, a troubled child's yeah. life. A broken child's life. A broken child's life, mm -hmm. which is exactly what that, those two things did for you. And I, I see it as a, a you as a flower, yeah. a broken flower mm -hmm. who was watered by watered. And words. Re and repotted. And repotted. And repotted. So you began to open up mm -hmm. and you became something new. You were becoming something new. And then you meet a young man there's always a young man it's in the story. It's always a boy. <laughs> it's always a boy always in the boy. story. <laughs> it's always a boy. Kenneth. And so yeah, I, I want to go through this a little quickly because we've got some questions and I want to get to them. You meet this young boy in the story. And I feel like the flower opens a little bit more. It does. And maybe there is an exploration now, not just of the mind, but of the heart. Mm -hmm. Can you expound quickly on quickly. that? So the quick thing is that last night I was in St. Louis. I saw, for those who have read the book, I saw Debbie Farrell last night. I saw Sandra Goins last night. She's in the book. My cousin Bug was there. I saw her last night. And Marcio, he's in the book. And Kenneth was there last night. The boy. The boy. <laughs> we are lifelong friends who I think he was just born at the wrong time, I guess. I don't know. Because he was older. He's older, a lot older. And I lied. I was like, yeah, I'm 16. <laughs> you <know? laughs> like, and you were really. you were really cute. I was 13 turning 14. And we were at our, we were graduating, I guess, ninth grade. We'd gone out to Six Flags. And I saw this little guy walking around the park and his youthful features and all that stuff. But he, um, we were following him. My girlfriend, Deb, and I followed him the whole day. We learned later, he would tell me years later, we were following you too. <laughs> so we were <laughs> dipping and diving through the park. And I finally stopped. And we, I tell the story in the book, but um, Kenneth becomes my friend in a way that no boy ever had. He was, as it turned out, six years older than me. 19, he was a freshman at University of Missouri, Columbia. He was going to be a lawyer. I said, I'm going to be a lawyer, too. So he's, uh, but Kenneth was, um, as much as I thought the world of him, he'd say, hey, he's got this really raspy voice. I'm going back to school, so if I write you a letter, would you write me back? I said, sure, I'll write you a letter back, right? And so we had this letter writing thing going back and forth, or I'd call uh, his dorm room in Columbia. He became a mentor for me in a way that I had never had another mm -hmm. visible person in my life. His father, Wendell, was a firefighter in St. Louis. His mother, Sandra, was a school teacher. They raised six children, put them all through college. Mm -hmm. And he just discovered for me that I was going to be, um, you know, the person he poured himself into as a young man. Um, he said he felt funny, you know, because I was young. And he said, you were really cute, he says. He <laughs> said, he said, you were really cute, he says. But 
Kenneth gave me more, told me about where the colleges were, right? And here's how you ought to be looking ahead to your future, because he had parents who thought like that, right? And so he showed me new and open things. My mother had her time to meet him and talk to him and kind of understand what his intentions were, because people were suspicious. But he never crossed a single line. Now, later on in life, Ken was like, you know what? Maybe we should go out on a date. You know, it was kind of a fun thing later on because his mother said to me, Dan, Goldie, 13 and 19 is a huge difference. Between 33, though, <laughs> and 39, it gets a little slimmer. Yeah, you're right. You know, right. and by the time you are this age and this age, it means it nothing at yeah. all. I find it interesting, yeah. though, that um, you had so many negative encounters mm -hmm. with men, with boys. Mm -hmm. That that you were able to trust mm -hmm. uh, and and feel comfortable with with this boy, but uh, I call it the exploration of the heart still, and so I want to I well, lastly want to ask you two things. As a child, what did you know of love? And as an adult now, looking back. What do you now know of love? Yeah. You know, I guess I was, you know, in my earlier years, I was love hard, love fast, and I'm all in. You know, you see my toes wiggling. I was so far into things. Um, but I had had, for all of the bad that I can recount about things, as Darlene would say, every day wasn't bad, that I saw Uncle Ross, who was a war veteran, loved my Auntie Gerald up, down, sideways, that you know hung his flag out on, uh, his American flag out on the front, he was a Korean War veteran, uh, ran the barbecue grill, made sure the children were in line, and the night, the lights never got turned off, the light bill was always paid on time. He was a full service gas station attendant back when there was such a thing at an Amico station in St. Louis. You can see the, still see the big Amico sign off the side of the highway mm -hmm. where he worked today. It is an iconic sign there, he worked there. And he was a concierge at a luxury condominium building. He left the car at home so my aunt could get to the store and get the kids around. He took the bus, the bi state bus, to work every day. And watching their love was a model for me. Watching my grandfather Roy and my grandmother Catherine, they lived in Miami, they were very well off people. And my grandfather was a member of Boulay and Garsman and all of these things. I have all these pictures of them going to the vineyard. And they lived in Cape Cod half the year and in Miami the other half. Um, but I watched how they did love and how they served one another. Um, they also could use the towels in the bathroom that weren't the fancy the, ones. They, they could use the they fancy towels. They actually used the fancy ones. They used the fancy okay. towels. So that was a weird thing. So I had seen love work. I'd seen it bad. I'd seen how men did my mother and what she had to do to protect herself. I had witnessed and been a part of what they had done to me personally. But I had seen Bryson and Mr. Rentman across the street who were raising these kids. I saw their love, strong and enduring and lasting. So you knew it was I knew possible. It. I knew what it looked like. It was plain as day. I knew what it looked like. So you, you, had, I you just still had belief in it. I just didn't think it. I was worthy of it. I just, think, I just didn't think I was worthy of it. Not early on, yeah. And as an adult? Won't settle for anything other than that. In your book, though, I thought your ending was quite powerful. Is it okay if I, I yeah. don't want, is it okay if I give it, I don't yeah. want to give it away. Oh, absolutely. Like, but you say. This is the place everybody comes to. So, <laughs> you know, there's, there's much to be said about the perseverance uh, that this book it brings out that you, you know, you're strong, that the, all of this difficulty and challenge and angst and toil and trauma that you endured made you stronger uh, and, and uh, more powerful. Um, but in the end, you say, yeah, but you know what, you can have all that. If I could just love better. If I could, if my heart could beat more evenly, I thought that was wow. How 
how powerful. You trade all of that, perseverance, better character, stronger, yeah. more powerful, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Throw it away. Yeah. If I could have, if I could just love better. Yeah. So what does that mean? So Patches is, and some of you all in this room know Eugene Duffy, funniest man in Atlanta. Eugene tells a joke, everybody else has been riled. And he's been, you know, just a friend over the years. And he said, Gold, I bet you'd give it all back, wouldn't you? I said, you're the first person that's ever said that, and that is absolutely true. That I say I'm reminded now of something else Baldwin said. Quote, and once you realize that you can do something, it would be <coughs> difficult to live with yourself if you didn't do it, he wrote in the Parish Review. I sometimes wonder what I might have been, but for the pus and scarring of sexual violence and how it formed and defined and confined me. But if suffering breeds perseverance and defines character, given the choice, I might have traded endurance for a heart that beats evenly. But mostly though, I want to love better. I have lived most of my adult life with people calling me something of a thing, or you're, you're smart, or you're pretty, or you're, you're something, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would trade all of those things, except for maybe my children, for just being what we kids call a regular schmegula, of just having a heart that is just easy. And if turning 55, it's coming to that. Yeah. So I'm getting to love better, I think. Still evolving. Still evolving. Yeah, still evolving. So I've got some questions here. <laughs> We're going to take about 10 minutes here to uh, And I'm going to move through. quick. I'll move quick. Okay. I promise. I'll move quick. So did you ever utilize therapy to deal with the sexual assault? Was therapy ever on the table, ever available? Did you ever use it? It wasn't available to us as children because people did not concede that black people could be in therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the one thing as children. Um, the first time I stepped into therapy, I knew exactly the day and when it was and who came. And um, it was my grown up falling down. And Darlene will remember this because she picked me up at Bennington Towers at 2480 Peachtree Street and said, we're going today. And that was my first time. And it was um, an experience that, you know, you just hit the rock bottom and this is now uh, 1997, where bottom finally falls out of things, and it has become a part of my toolkit that is as necessary as my yoga class, mm -hmm. is as necessary as the three mile run on Saturday morning, mm -hmm. that you spend the time mm -hmm. to talk it through. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, it, it wasn't until my later years, I mean in 1997, um, I was 29 years old before I ever stepped foot in a therapist's office. Yeah. But you got there. I got there. Uh, we looked him up in the phone book. <laughs> I see a forced maturity at 12 years old. What was the driving force to press forward at all costs? You know, I think the first around 12, you're just living and putting the day-to-day -day thing and you're existing, there's the Swanson dinners. Mm -hmm. The at all cost came thing when LeCompte taught me not only how to write essays, but how to join these speech competitions. And I started winning. Mm -hmm. And that I was winning and that people found value in what I was doing. I was gonna be here for whatever it took to get the next trophy, the next medal, the next whatever it was. I was in ninth grade killing 12th grade seniors and students and they were mad about it. Mm -hmm. And I was as glad as you could think, <laughs> sure. you know, glad as you could think I was. Yeah. Uh, I had the, the older cousin in the house was a standout basketball player. He was really good. He got benched when uh, Coach McNuckles figured out what was happening in our house, got mm -hmm. benched. Standout basketball player. I wanted to be as good in a speech and debate competition as he was on a basketball court. And playing for East St. Louis in basketball back then, you won state championships all the time. And so my goal was to win state and national championships, and that we did every single year. Yeah, you did. That was the thing that made me want to go. How often, yeah. 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 How often have we heard the phrase, take it to the grave? Mm -hmm. In telling your story, you freed yourself from shame. 
What do you think about society today and the movement to keep our story, the black American story, from our children by legislation? I think it's immoral. Mm -hmm. But we know what's driving it. Mm -hmm. You know, for the history of this country, one people has had the lock, stock, and barrel, the grip on what we were taught to believe and understand about this country. How do you expect for children to want to be a part of this franchise, to love, and you don't want to tell them how their ancestors helped build it, mm -hmm. that you want to cut them out of the story, but you want them to contribute, you know, mm -hmm. over time to it. And so um, that is what it is for me. You cannot take these things to the grave that the secrets themselves are often more deadly and more deadly poison um, than, you know, the knife or the sword or, or whatever other weapon there could be, that those kinds of ugliness, those kinds of things, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, you name the pathologies that beset our communities, the children in our neighborhoods, the studies will tell you, PTSD is more prevalent among our children than in veterans returning from war. That's what taking it to the grave will get you. And so I am in my older years, grown years, firmly against walking it to the grave. Um, but you deal with it how you want to. It's your story to tell or not to tell. But no one else should be the decider. Right, right. By writing this book, did uh, did this help you in any way towards healing yourself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and healing some, some fractures family-wise, I think, too. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's made me see myself more clearly, but I think I'm a better mother to my grown children, they'll tell you, that we are much more connected, I think, than we ever were. Um, it is a really beautiful thing that we have going on. And, you know, raising a 10-year-old, you know, it is now easier for me to see the other side of things. Uh, I am more quick to get the helps and supports in place mm -hmm. than I think I ever was before. So yeah, it has, uh, the writing the book taught me a lot about me, but it also taught me a lot about the people who raised me. Because you had to ask questions as you're going along and, and fact check and mm -hmm. figure out what was happening. I didn't know my grandmother worked at the Continental Bus Station cutting cakes in the 60s, the segregated bus station until my aunt and mother retired her. They didn't want their mother to work anymore. My, mother, my grandma was old when I was born. But I had no idea about that. That put a lot of things into context. I said, why she was around the house all the time, didn't have a job, mm -hmm. you know, but seemed to have more money than anybody else. I had no idea. But I figured out, you know, the disability checks, the circuit breaker checks from when her uh, husband Jesse died or the coal checks that came in. You know, I now realized, you know, how her life had been made and so, it made me look at myself differently. There's a lot of healing there. Mm -hmm. But it's healed a lot of family relationships, yeah. and that continues. What was the event or moment that led you to TV journalism? <laughs> I told you about that. It was watching other black women on TV. It was watching you all do your thing. I thought my time was gone. I had interned uh, back in uh, the early 90s for Amanda Davis at uh, what was then CBS 5. Mm -hmm. and running her, ripping and running her scripts and such. Um, so those things were super, I wanted to be there, but I thought my time had just, I didn't follow the traditional road, it was gone, wasn't gonna get it. And then one day I was, I was running a public relations advertising consultancy, and I wrote, NBC was my client. And I had worked for CNN, I had gone to, in, in public relations, as, as, as a consultant, and I had done the same work now for NBC, and I wrote this essay for the Griot. I had watched that day Barack Obama present his birth certificate to the White House press corps because Donald Trump said he needed to. I was so angry that I went into the newsroom and I banged out an essay that now is known as Show Me Your Papers. And I traced it back to my uh, second great grandfather who had come to St. Louis around the turn of the century and how he was forced to show his papers. I wrote that. 
A guy named Bill Wolf, who's still a friend today, was the executive producer for Rachel Maddow. He read it, and he gave it to Rachel. And so I was on Rachel Maddow that night. And that started the entirety of my television career. You know, at the late, old, ripe age, you know, I think I was 41. Yeah. And so the life, the career that I'd always wanted coming up as a child, it came. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Things happen for a reason. Yeah. Finally, what advice can you offer people who are trying to process their trauma while starting a family? Oh, goodness. If I had waited, I wouldn't have the children that I have today. <coughs> but my encouragement is always to work these things out before you start to pour into other folk. I kept myself out of a relationship for a really long time. Um, still good with that, right? Um, and so what I would say is you've got to be transparent with yourself. It is like getting over an addiction. You can get addicted to the drama and the trauma mm -hmm. and carry it in and out of relationships mm -hmm. with you everywhere you go and blow up every circumstance and good situation you have and you don't even know why it's happening. You don't know why you're showing up the way that you are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and why these people are responding to you the way that they are. Mm -hmm. Bob remembers that, right? Why they responding the way that they are. Um, but if you can get to a place where you're then seeing yourself clearly and seeing how you're presenting, that's where the work can really get started. Mm -hmm. But until you can really get in and start to do that work, well, you can't pour into anybody else. You can't love any better. Mm -hmm. Toni Morrison, that uh, wicked people love wickedly. Mm -hmm. Stupid people love stupidly. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would say around that. Get yourself healthy and whole because the person you adore deserves healthy and whole. Yeah. Goldie, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> So I do have some news, right? Um, this is the last night of the formal book tour unless we book more. I go to North Carolina on Saturday for this, what they call the movable yeah. book feast. Then I get to go home to my grandbaby. Tuesday, I get on a flight to New York because on Wednesday, and mark your time, your set, your DVRs, your things, I'll be on The View on Wednesday. All right. Yes. 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 So, my friend Sonny Hoskins made it happen. And so what I can say is, and I look around this, with Sonny, with Tamron, Gabrielle Union's on the back of this book, Brenda Wood is here with us tonight, you know, Chessie McCott, uh, McMillan Cottom, um, Mickey Kendall, who wrote Hood, Hood Femin Feminism. If I look around at my sisters who poured into me, I am eternally grateful. I could not, if I, you know, my, my boozy girl lunch is over there in the corner, right? <laughs> if I thanked you all a thousand times, a thousand times a day for a thousand years, it would not be enough. And so each of you in this room I know has had a piece of this. And so I just want to extend my gratitude to you, to you all. And if I could just tell you all at once, I would. But thank you. I was so spellbound I forgot to grab the mic. Well, just one more time, everyone. Thank our guests. And Brent. We'll meet you at the lobby if you would like your book signed. If you want your book, it is pre signed, but personalize it for you. Your book to done for you. Thank you again for coming out to the We appreciate you. Thank you.